Hi, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this webinar on uh, how to secure MongoDB uh, with the Server9 team. I'm Jean Jerome and I'll be looking after you today for the next uh, 60 minutes or so. It's good to have you with us. If you have any questions um, during this session, feel free to ask them in the question section of your control panel. Uh, you can also use the chat box to contact us, of course. And you can contact me directly um, during or after the webinar at jj at com uh, to ask for the questions or to continue the conversation there. Uh, we'll be happy to, um, to assist you, um, of course, uh, also after the webinar. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to uh, briefly introduce Cyber Nines and uh, Cluster Control and um, what we do. Uh, we specialize in um, the automation and management of open source uh, databases, and we focus here on these four main areas, the deployment, monitoring, management, and scaling aspects of, um, of running uh, open source databases in different types of environments. And um, as you can see, there's a number of, um, of different uh, feature sets around provisioning, uh, monitoring, and management, which, in, uh, which includes the, um, the scaling um, that you can go and, um, and test, of course, um, via our website on cybernines.com. You can download Cluster Control from there and um, try it out for free. We support um, these, um, the three most popular open source databases uh, out there today, MySQL in, its, in all its different flavors, MongoDB, uh, both by MongoDB and by Procona, and uh, Postgres SQL um, as well. Um, we are used and followed by uh, about uh, 12,000 users uh, to date. Uh, here is a snapshot of some of our customers uh, that range you know, across all of the different industry types that, um, that are out there. And, um, and of course, um, you know, we'd be happy for you to um, uh, check us out and, um, and to look for yourself uh, how class control uh, might be able to help you. But for today, the topic is all around MongoDB and uh, MongoDB security. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Art von Skeppingen, who is going to be uh, presenting and uh, doing a demo for us today. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and uh, with that said, um, I'd like to hand over to you, Art. Thank you very much, JJ. Uh, good morning. Today, uh, the topic is all about MongoDB security, and, uh, especially on how to secure MongoDB. Uh, we're also going to cover a little bit of the cluster control topic, but most of it will be about MongoDB itself. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, cover what uh, MongoDB ransom hack exactly is, uh, then cover some other security threats that are valid for MongoDB, and then I'm going to tell you how you can best secure yourself from either the ransomware or the other security threats that are out there. Uh, giving you a couple of tips how to hack yourself or hack your MongoDB instance. And then we'll cover what uh, Cluster Control can do for you in terms of security. And in the end, we'll show that using a live demo. So first of all, what is this MongoDB ransom hack? We have to go back about two years prior to the MongoDB ransom hack, where the University of Saarland in Germany found about 40,000 public MongoDB servers that were widely open to uh, anyone. And that basically meant that anyone who would connect to those MongoDB servers would immediately be admin. And they sent out um, to the media that there was this big issue and uh, everyone had to verify if their MongoDB servers were protected, yes or no. Uh, but nothing really happened for almost two years. Nobody actually cared. And then someone, some hacker rediscovered the vulnerability and uh, started to hijack servers. And all of a sudden this became a very big news. And that's about uh, when 2007 started. So what is this vulnerability exactly? Well, the biggest issue is actually uh, the default binding to every network interface on your MongoDB server. And that means that it will just bind to any interface using the 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 IP address. Uh, and this was a, a MongoDB default setting up until 3.0 and 3.0 then introduced changing this to localhost. So any MongoDB installation prior to 3.0 would have set the network interface to bind to everyone. 
Um, that being said, this is often changed by a sysadmin, DBA, or a DevOps guy in a multi-tenant environment where you are isolating your database from your application servers, and that means that you need to have network connectivity. So it's really annoying that you cannot con connect to it because it's now bound to localhost and not to uh, a network interface. So reverting this change is like a, a maybe 20 second job, uh, but probably overlooked by a lot of sysadmins, DBAs, or DevOps guys, what the implications can be. Then there's the issue of the default ports of MongoDB. Everyone knows the default ports, similar to, to for instance, MySQL. You know that 27.0.17 is the default port by MongoDB uh, for the MongoDB server or the Mongo S router. Uh, 27.0.18 and uh, 0.19 are used frequently as well. So that being said, having those default ports uh, exposed Anyone could just try to connect to that and then see whether there's a, there's a MongoDB instance running or not. Then there's the issue of the default settings of MongoDB where authentication and authorization are disabled by default. And well, th th this basically means that if you have no authentication at all, anyone connecting to this host is treated as an admin user. While these, uh, all these default settings or maybe just a, a simple change in your configuration uh, make your uh, MongoDB server vulnerable when it's exposed publicly on a host without any firewall rules. So if you're hosting it on, for instance, Amazon or uh, on Linode and you do not have any firewall rules in place and you have it bound to the public interface, anyone can connect to your MongoDB instance. So what is this ransomware then? Well, in December 2016, it emerged and basically someone took a scripted approach. They just have a script that just scans for open ports of MongoDB. And if there is a MongoDB instance, it first tries to log in, copy all your data. And once it has all your data, it removes all databases and collections, creates a warning collection containing something similar to this, where they demand 0.2 bitcoins for your data. And even if you pay, you most likely will never see your data. I mean, even if you're paying, it's not a guarantee you will get it back. So is MongoDB to blame here? Well, most of it is default behavior. So we have these well-documented default settings. Um, in some cases, deliberately, the MongoDB server is exposed by the, the sys admins, the TBAs, uh, just out of convenience. And then there's also the MongoDB security guide that uh, tells you how to secure your MongoDB server, and that's not being followed up here. So is MongoDB at fault here? If, if you may, would make an analogy to, for instance, a car, I, I can buy a car from a, a uh, let's say a car dealership, are they at fault that someone breaks into my car if I keep it unlocked? Well, certainly not. Uh, but me as a user should know how to protect myself from car theft. So you could make an analogy like that. So who is then targeted by this ransomware? Well, as I said before, MongoDB instances with uh, which are bound to a public interface, bound to a default port, or uh, have no or weak authentication enabled, or no firewall rules or security groups in place, meaning it's publicly available. The ransomware scans for hosts on default ports. They could also scan for non-default ports, uh, and if they give a MongoDB response, then it's a MongoDB server. Uh, and it just identifies those MongoDB instances. How does this work? Well, if we take uh, an example with a, a multi-tenant environment where we have uh, some clients going over the internet to your hosting environment, which is in uh, within an internal network. We have a load balancer here that uh, has a couple of web services connected and those web servers are serving out the application connecting to your MongoDB primary to do read and write operations. However, your application also needs to get data from MongoDB via some REST interface. So 
someone adds the port 27017 to the load balancer out of convenience that your application can read it, for instance, using uh, the REST interface or using some jQuery type of uh, inclusion here. And it also means that the port 27017 is exposed to the internet and then the, the ransomware or uh, the, the hacker, whoever you would call it, can connect directly to the MongoDB server. It could also be the case that if you have a public network, let's say you have a couple of Amazon instances that are not within uh, the same uh, private network, but all are publicly on the internet and everyone connects to the host publicly, um, that MongoDB is exposed to the internet. This is this is also happening a lot. And then, of course, you can immediately connect to the MongoDB server. So this happened, let's say, two and a half months ago. And have people secured their MongoDB servers by now? Well, no. You can see clearly in the in the stats here that uh, hardly anything. Uh, happened in the past year in terms of uh, uh, protection of MongoDB servers. I have to make uh, a remark here that uh, the Shadow Server Foundation is scanning only for MongoDB servers that are exposed to the internet. So this is definitely not the ones that have, uh, for instance, authentication disabled. It could very well be that the authentication has been enabled here, but we'll get to that uh, later in this presentation on um, why that doesn't even, uh, or it doesn't necessarily protect you from anything. To give you also some insight, this, this is a picture of all the MongoDB instances around the globe uh, that are current, uh, that are that were uh, exposed uh, on the 28th of December, and this is the same picture of. Well, yesterday, so not today. So yesterday, this is the, the same picture. And I'll, I'll flip back and forth a few times and you can see that hardly anything has changed in the past three months. So this is really worrying because that means that even though there was a lot of news about the MongoDB uh, ransom hack, uh, not everyone was following up on that. Some other statistics. Good to know where are those MongoDB instances? Well, the top 20 countries, uh, you can clearly see United States and China are the biggest two countries. And you can see on the right, the networks where they are active. So it's mostly Alibaba and Amazon that are uh, vulnerable here. And that makes sense because a lot of people just open up like one instance, and maybe it's a test instance or some staging uh, environment. Uh, where you just want to try out something and you set it up and uh, then forget about it. But it clearly shows that it's mostly cloud environments where the biggest threat is. So what are vulnerabilities within MongoDB? Um, well, the, the web interface, it is generally uh, enabled on uh, any uh, MongoDB instance prior to 3.2, uh, where it runs on the MongoDB port, so 27017 plus 1000. The status interface shows you operational data. So uh, for instance, which uh, collections and databases are available. Uh, the log files are directly accessible from here. So that could also mean that some people may see the users that you're using to log into the systems and some status reports. Then there's the REST interface, where it even allows you to send and receive data. Yeah, and this is really worrying. And that's also the reason why MongoDB deprecated this interface in 3.2, because it was a serious threat. Then there's the server-side JavaScript. Uh, MongoDB allows you to uh, do server-side JavaScript interpretation. And that's generally very useful if you're doing a lot of MapReduce operations. Uh, so if you have uh, your analytics done via MapReduce, uh, you could do a lot of programmatically within the MapReduce commands. However, these may be vulnerable to command injections and create buffer, flow, buffer overflows. 
And those buffer overflows can create segmentation faults, which can cause a denial of service of MongoDB. So also this is something that could be used by attackers. Then we have the MongoDB wire protocol. The Mon MongoDB wire protocol is basically whatever goes over the network to send your commands or receive data from MongoDB. And this wire protocol includes built info, uh, and that's there to determine whether uh, it is able to do, for instance, uh, the encrypted uh, password authentication. The version-specific vulnerabilities can then be targeted using the build info. Uh, so you can look up, for instance, uh, there's a vulnerability for LDAP authentication uh, or there's a denial of service uh, in 3.00 uh, that you could um, exploit using this. For the current versions, there is no critical vulnerability known yet, but if one would emerge, that would also mean that a lot of people uh, should be very aware of uh, this uh, vulnerability within the MongoDB uh, wire protocol. Uh, you can best follow mongodb.com slash alerts to keep yourself updated on any vulnerability that's coming up for MongoDB. Excessive writes. Um, it's less of an issue because you first need to have access to an instance. However, uh, for MongoDB, the roles and users are not centrally stored in uh, a single database like MySQL, but it's stored within the database you connect to. It also means that those local users, uh, if they have a, a user admin role or similar rights, they will be able to grant the admin role to any database they have rights to. And normally you cannot bypass this authentication except when you authenticate command line. So I'm going to show an example how, how to do that. Um, or if you first authenticate to a, a specific database and then switch databases to another database. Now, if I would have, for instance, a, a user, uh, the, the admin user here with a very bad admin password, by the way, um, we would connect to the test database. We would create a user called user with password pass and uh, grant it uh, read write on test database. Uh, it also has user admin on the test database because we need it, uh, because we're going to inject something using uh, the test database. And then it needs to have the user admin on uh, another database, so exploit it in this case. Then we would connect using this user command line, using the authentication database test, and we would be able to create a user called exploit for the exploited database and grant it DB admin, which is far greater rights than, uh, let's say, the user admin rights. And then we would be able to connect to uh, this exploited database using the authentication database, using the exploit user. And this means that we now have bypassed the local authentication of the exploit, exploited database uh, and have a user that has excessive rights on this database. So this is one of the things uh, you have to be very careful with. Um, before I jump into how to secure MongoDB from ransomware, um, we do have a poll. So JJ, can you uh, show us the poll? Yeah, thanks a lot, Art. Um, thank you. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask um, our participants today this uh, quick question around uh, security. And just to get an understanding of how you rate security yourselves and your company today, uh, whether it's the highest on your, on your list, um, uh, whether it's very important or important, um, maybe it's somewhat important, but you know, there are other things that come in the way sometimes. Uh, or maybe it's not um, not the highest on your list. Uh, it'd be great to uh, to get your feedback here. I'll just let us run for a bit and uh, get everyone the chance to participate. Thanks very much for taking the time to um, uh, to provide your feedback here. And uh, just to remind you also that you can ask us questions, of course, at any point by using the question section of your control panel. Uh, but for now, thanks for uh, th uh, thanks for your participation here. I'm just going to close this and share the results. 
So maybe that's not too surprising. Um, uh, you know, it was going to be important, of course. Uh, security is an important topic. So um, and it's you no, know, it's a good. Um, I think it's a good. Um, a good choice, you no, know, very important. Um, um, that's um, that, that's a good uh, a good way to go. Um, thanks for your participation here. Uh, not uh, not too surprising, I think, the result, Art. And uh, I'll hand uh, back over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would say. Let's see if I'm sharing my screen again. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that if, if you're going to attend this session, obviously you find it very important to have MongoDB security. Um, so how to secure MongoDB from ransomware uh, and other vulnerabilities? Well, first of all, uh, enable your authentication. That would, that would just stop most of the issues um, by simply enabling authentication in your MongoDB conf. Uh, restarting MongoDB, obviously. Uh, you explicitly enable the authentication. You can also implicitly enable it by adding a, a, the key file. The key file, I'll, I'll get to that uh, in one of the later points, but uh, if you enable it, it will automatically also enable authentication because it cannot work without that. Uh, and also, before doing this, don't forget to create an admin account first. So if you don't have any users, uh, and you would enable authentication, you would no longer be able to log in into your MongoDB instance. Uh, second, don't use weak passwords. Uh, enabling authentication uh, is one, but uh, if you have a, an easy to guess user password combination, uh, you better don't have any uh, authentication at all. And uh, an attacker may brute force your uh, users and passwords uh, using, for instance, uh, the, the easy to guess ones like admin and then a couple of combinations. And if you do the script, uh, you can brute force thousands of combinations remotely. And there are some brute force tools already readily available that you can just download. You can just point it to a MongoDB instance and then tell it to try for certain uh, usernames and then it will just try whatever it can think of and it will just continue to do that. Authorization users by role. Um, so authentication is one, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's a very good idea to just make the admin user and not have any other user at all. Um, you better create a user per role. So you have a read-write user, you have a user that's able to create schemas, you have a user that is able to create indexes, or maybe you combine that user. Um, and also don't hand out excessive rights. Like I've shown you before, it can be uh, very tricky to have excessive rights in MongoDB. Also, cluster control will create a separate admin and backup, backup user to separate these roles. You don't want the admin account um, to also be the backup user, or sorry, it's the other way around. You don't want the backup user to be admin at the same time. Uh, otherwise, the backup software might actually be able to do things that you don't want it to. Um, and, and similarly, there are, uh, I think about 20 different roles predefined in MongoDB and you can create even your own roles with per database in MongoDB and then mix and match with uh, certain functionality. So that is also a possibility. Um, add a replication key file. I'm, I've spoken about this earlier. Um, the replication key file is very important because uh, new secondaries uh, in MongoDB can join freely. You just have the privilege of being a cluster manager of or the admin role, and you can uh, issue a command from the primary at this and this host as a secondary. And without any verification whether this uh, node is part of the cluster or is supposed to be part of the cluster, uh, it will join. It will just start to um, sync data if possible. Uh, copy over uh, any remainder of the op log afterwards. So it, it's not restricted at all. And to add some restrictions here, uh, MongoDB added a key file to MongoDB. So instead of uh, having uh, the, the admin account or the cluster manager with the rights to add the secondary, you also need to possess something 
physically on the server to allow it to join the host. And without this key file, uh, the host cannot add itself to a replica set. And these key files are not publicly exposed. So they are on the MongoDB server. They are in the ETC directory. And um, an attacker cannot remotely read this file. Now, enabling replication key file will also implicitly enable authentication. And the reason why is because without uh, authentication uh, and having a, a roles attached to a certain user, you will not have the, the, the distinguishing factor between a normal user and a cluster manager. So that's why it's implicitly enabling authentication. Also from cluster control, we uh, set those key files by default because we are uh, absolutely certain that this is the best way to uh, secure your cluster. Make your backups regularly. Um, even if someone is able to hack your MongoDB instance, um, it's better to always have a backup ready, uh, especially if they try to demand money for, uh, for your data. Um, you don't have to pay them to put your data back. And also, um, even if they were able to hack your system, delete all the databases and um, uh, collections, you can still make a point in time recovery using the uplock. And the uplock is not, um, well, you can't control it remotely. You would be able to do uh, certain things to make the uplock empty. So you, the attacker may be writing lots and lots and lots of data to uh, clear out the uplock. However, uh, if your uplock is big enough, they will not be able to do that at all. So make backups regularly, also ensure that the uplock is large enough. Cluster control has a very good backup interface and it can make backups for you on a scheduled uh, uh, interval. Now, another way to uh, hide your MongoDB instances would be running it on a non-standard port. Uh, the MongoDB default ports are well known to attackers and you know, by setting it to a non-standard port, you have a very high chance that they will never ever find your MongoDB instance. Of course, uh, people can still um, use, use a script to open up every port on your server and see whatever responds to opening up the port. Uh, however, MongoDB is not a server first reply. That means that, uh, for instance, MySQL, if you would open up the MySQL port, it would immediately prompt you for a password, while MongoDB is waiting for a MongoDB message to be sent to the MongoDB server. So it may actually deflect port scanners. Um, and then you can easily change it with a one line change in the Mongo config. Uh, and cluster control allows you to customize this during deploy time. And also after deploying, you can easily change this from the, the interface. Now, another question you may ask yourself, does your application actually require public access? Uh, in the case of MongoDB, it will by default bind itself to local host. So if we have this example here uh, where we are sharing our web server with the MongoDB server, um, it would only need to access localhost to make the changes necessary. So in this case, we can just leave it uh, as it is, or if we have changed it already, revert it back to the default. However, if you have a multi-tenant environment, it would be better to actually bind it only to the interfaces that you require it to. So you just provide the uh, IP addresses that it needs to bind to, and then it will only bind to those interfaces and not listen on the other interfaces. Um, also a good uh, practice is to enable firewall rules or security groups as they're called in cloud environments. Um, even if your host is on a private network and not publicly exposed, it's always good to create firewall rules because attackers may also come from the inside. They can use uh, a web server or anything else as a jump box 
and then go into your uh, private network and still be able to attack your MongoDB server. Um, limit your access only to the host that really need to connect to the MongoDB instance. So just define the IP addresses or maybe an IP range that uh, you think is safe to add. Another good one is to disable server-side JavaScript. I've explained earlier that they can uh, inject uh, commands into uh, server-side JavaScript. They can also create segmentation faults. Uh, if you don't use it, just disable it. It's uh, a one line to disable it. And it may annoy maybe uh, one or two persons that are actually willing to use it maybe two years after you have disabled it, but then you can still enable it afterwards. But it's good practice to disable it. Also disable the HTTP interface. Uh, it's deprecated from 3.2 onwards, but if you have an older version of MongoDB, just simply disable it. Um, even if you're using it, there are better alternatives to uh, the MongoDB HTTP interface. Um, to to uh, get status or get the log files or even a REST interface. There, there are uh, many of the REST interfaces available publicly. Um, so there are a lot of GitHub projects that do a similar job as this one, but are better suited for uh, security. Um, then the last point is enable audit logging. Uh, if you enable the audit log, uh, you would be able to scan for, uh, for instance, the, the drop collection, drop database, drop index, or rename collection, and you would then afterwards be able to see what happened, why it happened, uh, or you could even do preventive measures where you're scanning, for instance, for IP addresses that are connecting to MongoDB that are not supposed to be connected to MongoDB. So you could do a little, little bit of preemptive um, uh, security here. Keep in mind that the audit log is an enterprise feature of MongoDB. Uh, it is available in Percona Server for MongoDB. Uh, they created their own implementation. It doesn't follow 100% the MongoDB version, uh, but it is close and they're, uh, they're, they're developing um, against it that it will be equal eventually. Um, okay, uh, I, I accidentally skipped this one. Um, the next tip we're going to give you is try to hack your own instance because you know you can try all these preventive measures, but if you if you don't even try to hack yourself and think you're safe, uh, it's not the complete picture. So what you can do is you can, uh, first of all, check for external co connectivity. You can use any uh, cloud box you, uh, you can find. Uh, there are even some uh, AWS boxes in a, in a free tier where, where you can use it maybe for a couple of hours per day, and that would be uh, more than enough. From the outside, you try to tell that to your own host, and uh, if, if it uh, responses, uh, you can see here it's trying to connect to the host and it says like, okay, the, the port is open and it's waiting for you to send it a command. And obviously you can immediately see that the port is open, but it doesn't say that it is a MongoDB instance that's behind this. If you want to know more whether it's vulnerable or uh, whether you should be aware that anyone can do things in your instance. You have to install Nmap, which is a free tool on Linux. You can just install it using yum or apt. Any package manager has it. Uh, Nmap is able to scan ports. You provide here the script MongoDB databases, uh, which is going to retrieve all the MongoDB databases of your instance. So you can see here that it responds with, okay, uh, we've got a couple of databases, total size is uh, 16 uh, megabytes. Uh, size on disk, we have a test database, we have an admin database, and I uh, cut out the middle section because it was getting too long. Uh, but as long as you get the response, you know that it's MongoDB instance and it has databases. 
then if MongoDB port would be closed, so properly firewalled, or it's running on a different port, you would see immediately TCP closed, known, and Nmap would just give you uh, enough information that you can skip the, the further tests. Um, this is also the way uh, attackers are uh, trying to find exposed MongoDB servers. If you have authentication enabled, but the port is still open, uh, think back about, um, remember the, the, the picture that I've shown about the world, about all those exposed hosts. It could very well be that the majority of them are running authentication, but the port is still open and still responds. This is what is shown in that map. So we have about 20,000 of these servers. Um, MongoDB databases, it says like it's not authorized to execute the command list databases. So uh, that would be a very good indication that there is a MongoDB instance, but it's uh, uh, asking for uh, authentication. What can you do with that information? Well, we could use a different script called MongoDB info. And using MongoDB info, you would see that it gives you a lot of information about your MongoDB instance, even though it requires authentication. The MongoDB info is the information being sent by the wire protocol to, um, to expose to the client connecting what features are enabled in MongoDB, in this MongoDB server. So we can see here that we have a JavaScript engine, which is Mozilla JavaScript. Uh, we have a target architecture. Uh, we have OpenSSL, so these are OpenSSL libraries that have been fixed for the Heartbleed bug. Imagine that you can see uh, the libraries that have not been fixed. You immediately know that you can do some sort of attack using the Heartbleed bug. Um, and then further down, you can see the MongoDB version here, 3.2.10.3.0. And then you can look it up in MongoDB alerts, or you can go to uh, CVE and then find uh, whether this version is vulnerable and then attack it. And this is really um, uh, something important that you should, should keep an eye on. Um, if you are exposing this information to the public, that your version is patched. Then uh, the excessive privileges. We've covered that earlier. MongoDB authenticates against the database you connect to. Uh, it, it, if you have additional rights to other databases in a user, uh, it, it will be able to create excessive roles for other users. Also switching databases will not re-authenticate the user against uh, the, the database you're connecting to. It's only uh, being authenticated against the database that you initially connected to. Um, Notice that uh, in this case, we have uh, additional rights on the admin database in this example. Um, and that's really scary because that also means that this user is able to read and write the admin database. Now, what you can do against this is just review the privileges of all databases. So you use the database uh, in question, you loop over every data store in your uh, in your MongoDB server, and then you do db get users, and you would see uh, for every user uh, what roles they have uh, on which data store. And then you can see immediately that we have a role read write on the admin database, and this is excessive. So we need to do something about this. Um, now I've skipped over. Uh, this one. Uh, so what does cluster control offer for security features? Well, we by default enable authentication uh, during deployment. So whenever you create a new MongoDB instance, uh, whether it's a replica set or a shard of cluster, we enable authentication, we enable replication key, we bind the configured IP address uh, so not all IP addresses are configured by default. The port numbers can be customized. Uh, we disable HTTP REST API if uh, applicable. Uh, we force creation of an admin account. So you really have to provide an admin account, otherwise you cannot add it. 
Uh, and then we have the separation of roles, admin and backup user. Then we have the authentication advisor, which is uh, a small scriptlet that is constantly checking whether authentication has been enabled explicitly, implicitly, and it warns if this has been disabled. And here you can see in the output that it has been uh, enabled implicitly via the security key file, so everything is okay. Then we have the authorization advisor that verifies users' roles per database. It checks for weak passwords, it checks for excessive roles, uh, and it checks for excessive roles on other databases and warns you if these conditions have not been met. And you can see here in the output that the password for a user admin for the database admin is too easy to guess and guess what the password is. Um, consider changing the password uh, would be the best advice here. Um, Okay, so now it's time for the uh, cluster control live demo. Um, but I still think we have uh, another poll coming up. JJ? We do, yeah, thank you, Art. Um, just, so just as you set up um, for the demo, uh, I'd like to run another poll um, and ask um, our audience today this quick question. You know, on average, you know, if you can um, somehow um, uh, guesstimate, you know, how much time you spend on average um, per week on security. It'd be really interesting to um, to hear, you know, uh, how much time do you think is relevant um, uh, or how much time is taken up by security issues um, in your week usually. Um, that would be good to uh, that would be good to hear. And uh, just to remind you also, there's a few questions already, but um, you know, if you want, to, if you have questions to ask on today uh, today's content, feel free to ask them. Of course, at any point. Um, uh, during the during the session, um, but for now, thanks for your participation in this poll. Um, I'm just going to uh, close this now and share the results. Uh, great, so it's a 50-50 split. Um, it seems uh, between well, uh, it's probably um, uh, around around the same, really one to two hours or two to four hours. Um, per week, so it is an important topic, of course, and um, it's been um, it's been highlighted um, how important it is uh, recently. Yeah. Um, so good to see that um, everyone is spending you know a good bit of time on it uh, per week. Um, what's what's your thoughts, Art? Well, I think, I think um, I, I, when I when I created those questions, I was putting in there four to eight hours, and I was already doubting whether someone would spend that amount of time per week on security because that's a little bit excessive. Uh, and eight hours or more, that, that then you're probably a security officer or something similar. So, uh, I think this is in line with my expectations, and it's a good trade-off. Great, great, thank you, and thanks uh, everyone for your participation here. And uh, I hand uh, back over to you, Art. Thanks. Let me switch the screen to cluster control. Uh, can you see my screen now, JJ? We can, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So what we have here is the, the, the default overview uh, dashboard of cluster control. So once you have logged in into cluster control, this is immediately what you will see. We have a MongoDB replica set here and a sharded cluster. In both cases, they're up and running. All the nodes are available. Uh, however, if I would deploy a new, uh, exist or a new or existing database cluster, and then choose a MongoDB replica set. I'm going to uh, quickly uh, add a test database here and then show what you can do here in terms of security. Um, so what we have here is the server port that we can uh, customize. So we have the, the 27017, so you can easily change this to a different port. And then within cluster control, this port will always be used and not uh, the, the default one. You can also create your own templates uh, on the cluster control host, and in there you can add your own uh, security settings. Uh, it, on the tool, it says where you can find those templates, you can define them, and then starting from that template onwards, um, that will happen. Similarly, for the MongoDB shards, uh, let's show that as well. We have uh, also, the configuration servers and the Mongo routers that you can customize in ports. 
Uh, and then uh, if you define the shards, you can also do that with uh, the ports of the shard nodes. And that way you can deflect uh, the MongoDB port scanner. Um, as I said earlier, what you can do to change the configuration afterwards is you just simply go to the configuration. You would change the port number, which is here. So you would be able to change the port and then um, obviously restart is required. Uh, furthermore, we have the advisors. I've shown them earlier with their output. So we have a couple of advisors here. And you can see that uh, these are the same ones that I've shown in my screenshots earlier, uh, where the authentication has been enabled, but the admin has a very easy password to guess. Now, if we would go to uh, the other instance, Um, I'm missing something here. I thought I scheduled them for this host. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to show that at least here the the, the password is. Uh, I made a difficult password for this host, and then it wouldn't uh, start complaining about that one. But uh, unfortunately, I cannot show that as uh, I, I probably have configured. Uh, the uh, advisor not to run. Uh, furthermore, uh, we have the backup interface here where you uh, can create backups, you can schedule them. So you would be able to make like a weekly, daily, hourly uh, backup using MongoDump or MongoDB Consistent. MongoDB Consistent is uh, important for a MongoDB shard of cluster. Uh, while well, for a replica set, you uh, only need MongoDump. Um, and then under Manage, we have the Developer Studio, where we have those advisors in, under MongoDB Security. Uh, you can customize them if you would like to, uh, like for the authorization uh, check, you would, be, you, you would be able to add, for instance, your own passwords that you can uh, check, you can uh, define the admin roles that you want, that you think are excessive or too permissive. Um, also, you would be able to add your own security checks here as well. We are constantly trying to improve cluster control. And uh, obviously, this is only the start of the uh, security checks that we're performing. Uh, one of the things that we're currently working on is, uh, is the audit log checker, whether the, uh, there's anything in the audit log and uh, whether it's um, it, it, it contains certain entries. So we're working on that, but uh, of course that's a work in progress. Um, and that's about all I can show about the MongoDB security. Uh, most of it is just hidden behind uh, the, the cluster control uh, backend that is doing most of the work. So the user interface doesn't show you a whole lot uh, compared to what is actually happening in background. I'll switch back to the live demo then. Um, okay, we performed the demo. Uh, now we end up in the Q&A section. Uh, JJ, you said there were a couple of questions. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Um, so let's have uh, let's have a look here. Um, okay, so there's a question here on um, the replication key file. Yeah. And uh, the question is whether the replication key file is global for all databases or whether it's per database user. No, it's uh, global for all databases. So you enable the replication key file uh, and. Remember, this, this is not, um, uh, it's, it's only a token identifying that this secondary is allowed to join in the replication stream. Um, so it's, it's like it has a key to the replication stream. It says, okay, I'm, I'm part of it and this is my token and I can join now. 
Um, and that means that all databases inside this instance will uh, uh, will use the same key file. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Art. Um, that was a question by Andre, and Andre has another question actually, so we can ask that. We can look into that as well. Yep. And the question is around MongoDB access and whether MongoDB access on socket, um, whether MongoDB access is on socket if on local host. Uh, no, no. In contrary to MySQL, it doesn't have uh, a socket that you can read or write to. It really has to be the local host port. So just put, Great. just listen on the loopback interface. Great. Um... Great, thanks, Art. Um, another question here, and that's uh, that's I guess it's an easy one, but it's to ask whether um, whether there will be a recording uh, of the session made available. And to, so the answer to that is yes, uh, of course. So we've uh, we've recorded the session, and we we'll make the recording available um, in the next uh, in the next couple of days. Um, so so do look out for that. Um, and Art, I believe there are, we have uh, links to some uh, additional resources um, on the next yeah. Um, slide. Um, yeah. So we have the so we can see. Talk. On MongoDB, uh, that's where all our blog posts about MongoDB end up at, and we have a lot of uh, blog posts lately about security as the topic. Um, and then we have ob obviously a link to MongoDB uh, cluster control for MongoDB, so you can go to the product page of cluster control and see what features we have for MongoDB, and then. Uh, I think that's also the page with the uh, demonstration video. Um, and then we have here a link on where you can download cluster control. Great, yeah. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Marian Art. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, I don't see any other questions for now. Um, and um, you know, we're almost um, on the finish line for for today's uh, for today's session. Um, any final comments, Art, before we finish? Um, yeah, the, the, the thing that I was really uh, surprised about was the fact that even though there uh, was a lot of exposure about the ransom hack uh, and a lot of people were uh, uh, blogging about it, twittering about it, uh, and even the majority of those tweets were like, oh my God, this is really bad. and uh, um, uh, we really should do something about it. And probably something happened with uh, uh, the people that were concerned about this already, uh, and they secured their instances. But the majority of the exposed instances uh, were never reached uh, with this message. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's only the, the beginning of, uh, of, of, let's say, the uh, awareness of for, for people that you really should, should secure databases, including MongoDB. And I think uh, in our case, uh, we as several nights, we have other database platforms as well, like MySQL and Postgres, and we're definitely on top of that, or, or uh, we're, we're working on uh, securing and, and, and uh, making security awareness for those uh, databases as well. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and um, and uh, on that note, um, thank you, Art. On that note, we have um, we also have some uh, new resources coming out um, uh, soon on uh, how to secure your MySQL and uh, MariaDB databases. Uh, so look out, uh, look out for that um, as well, of course. Um, but I think for now um, we we can probably uh, wrap up for today. Uh, thanks a lot, Art, for the the presentation and the the demonstration. Thank you. And uh, thanks to those of you who participated um, today in today's session. Thanks for your questions as well. Um, like we said, the recording is available or will be available in the next uh, couple of days, and you can always reach out to us uh, via these links here on um, on your screen. Uh, so thanks for today. Um, have a good rest of the day and a good week, um, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you, and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.